His disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. When I thought about how God teaches things and how he teaches me and how I move into ministry or how I've always done things in my life as a born-again Christian, as a Christian who's been saved literally since 1974 that uh, and I can't think what is that 37 years now 37 years as a born again Christian that from the moment I got saved I had such a phenomenal experience and it was at the height of the Jesus moment that most of us just went directly into ministry we didn't we didn't know we were supposed to go to Bible college or seminary or schooling we just went out and started telling everyone about Jesus some of us went on to be pastors and elders and deacons and whatever. Some of us went out as missionaries to all different parts of the world. Some of us, God was still developing, so he took us through marvelous experiences and wonders of life and <laughs> pain and suffering and agony in order to be prepared for those things at the end of the life, the end of this age that would come upon all people and that we would be ministers, you know, to the entire body of believers. And that's what I think that a lot of people in the Jesus movement maybe didn't know or didn't realize was that God took us and made us unique because we really had a bigger picture of the entire bride of Christ than maybe some people did in getting stuck in kind of a narrow framework. And so we minister, you know, and share the love of God to everyone, everywhere, any way we can, everywhere we can. But just recently, you know, I was asked several questions that I thought fit this devotional. And one of them was a man came to me and asked several questions and I responded to them in writing and being that I have an intellectual mind and a pragmatic logistic to my argument and debate, meaning that I know how to use the, the method of reasoning and rationale that we call argument, which is just part of logic. It's just what you do when you are making a thesis and a debate and a discussion and you're trying to come to a conclusion that is provable, not, not debatable. And so, you know, I made a point, you know, and I responded and made a point and I let him keep talking. And, Gradually, he got off on his final tangent of what he wanted to say, rather than commenting on what the post that he was commenting on had said, which was a very uplifting message. It was simply, please don't spread fear. And he wanted to make the point that we're supposed to make people fearful in some way, which, you know, is easy to you know talk about, and we could have solved that in personal conversation than five minutes, probably. But... Since I don't have that opportunity, he came at me in writing and said something about, are you ever wrong? I said, sure, every day. <laughs> I said, watch one of my videos. I have no problem admitting I'm wrong. As a matter of fact, I tell anyone when I'm wrong. But there's also a point that maybe he didn't realize is that I don't choose those things I don't know about and discuss when I don't know about it. I don't go out of my way to find things that are debatable and argue about them and make some kind of issue that it's not profitable to a person to learn about Jesus with. Because why would I? I mean, don't get me wrong now. I kind of, because I'm a Jesus freak and I call myself a Jesus just because that's what God has really used my life as. But when I say I don't get into controversial subjects, it's not that I don't get into those subjects. I don't get into things I don't know the answer for. If I don't know the answer, I just simply say, I don't know, so I don't get myself sticking my neck out on something I don't know about. But what I do know about is huge as far as 
going after and challenging God dramatically at great, you know, right to his face, you know, God, I want to know. And because of that, the accountability factor is that to whom much is given, much is required. So a lot of times I share volumes of stuff, you know, that God has poured in me and do my life's experiences and things other people maybe didn't think about. Like when Arsenio Hall used to go, hmm, you know, well, sometimes people don't think, they just speak. And I learned from Proverbs and my study of Proverbs that my words reflected my thinking. So if I had stinking thinking, it was because it was my words that were coming out that probably my mind was not programmed right and I needed to reprogram it back into completeness of the scripture and the way that God operates, deals, and acts in order for me to be a, an accurate representative of who he is, what he is, and how he does things. And so as that, I always wanted to know what the answer was, and why people thought this or did this or acted that way or were kind of like that way or going this way or going that way. And most of the time, God told me. So I've never avoided issues and I've never felt like I didn't have an answer for the reason for the hope that lies within me. I may not have given the answer they're asking, but I've always hit the answer right according to what they said and what God wanted them to know. And they've always, anyone has always agreed, well, yeah, that was the answer. You know, maybe not right away, but eventually. Sometimes they come back and tell me, <laughs> praise the Lord. But recently there's been a, a subject that people have confronted me on. And after telling him that I admitted that I was wrong and everything, um, I ran into another situation about the subject matter I want to talk to share with you about. But when I told him that I was wrong, I said, yeah, but what I'm usually wrong about is when I, more often than not, get involved with or involve myself in the things of the world that aren't important, that really have no bearing on what the reality of the universe is and what God is doing. And at those times, I admit, I said, hey, you know what? I sinned. I was in sin, born in sin, raised in sin, committed sin, you know? So I either got mad at the reality of what God you know, may have said this way and I decide I want to go that way and I go, yeah, I was wrong. I went that way and God wanted me to go that way. God told me and I said, no, I want to go that way. So I went that way and proved I was wrong. And I know it at the time and it's rebellious and it's a sin of rebellion. I'm able to, you know, get into the whole big picture of why I do what I do when I do it. Because to me, when I'm honest about it and truthful, the Holy Spirit takes that chance to just lay it all out on the carpet and I get a chance to look at it and go, me, you know, and so I have no problem admitting wrong. But the same point, I have no problem being right either. Because in my mind, God wanted someone like me who has no fear of being who I am and sharing the bluntness of what God is. And sometimes that means that you have to go against the grain of what people are doing. And I don't mean like trying to beat someone to death for salvation or wringing their neck because you, you're trying to make them into a cookie cutter Christian or, you know, some image of what you think they should be. No, I'm talking about other issues, you know, that are relevant to our society and to where you and I live today. As a matter of fact, one of them is about children. Children. You know children. Fruit of the loins. The ones that most men and women think they create and they forget that God is the third party in creation, that he is there, even as he said in the book of Genesis that God said, and then God created, but he says in John also that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, the word was God. So when God said that was the word and that was Jesus there in creation and he is the creator. And so if the father is there, then the son is there and the spirit is there. So there's three in one. There's always three in partite. There's tripartite to everything that there exists in life. You may not know that, but you can go study it, you know, and figure it out. If you want to figure out body, soul, and spirit, you know, and go there and then go into every plant and every animal and every single circumstance, you'll find that there's tripartite in some way. Creator, created, and spirit. You know. But anyways, we're not going to get into that depth of, you know, the 
complete ramifications of the uni the unification of the oneness of God and the Godhead and triunity of the aspects of who God is and what he is. But in knowing that, you should recognize that when you have a child, father and mother, you have God who initiated the life. It's not just a process of physical being that happens. God is there too. That's why he's called creator. Yes, he gives the blessing to be fruitful and multiply, but he's not absent from the process. No. He breathed into man and he became a living soul. The soul is not imparted except that God is there. Sorry. Otherwise, it's just a physical process. And you would say that man could create a soul. Can't happen. Sorry. Doesn't work that way in scripture. But you can say that God breathed into the baby and it became a living soul. Now, when that happens, you know, we're not going to get into some kind of abortion debate or anything else like that. Because that's even another subject. But the point is, there's three people in a child. The father, the mother, and God. So, in dealing with that aspect of knowing that children are holy unto the Lord, that God has imparted in some way a participant in that, I think people somehow don't understand where I'm coming from and they've challenged me regularly when I've talked to them and posted my one-liner. I have this little paragraph now that I post whenever I see videos of children on the internet and it talks about exploitation of children. Because you see, if I want to take a picture of my child, oh, wow, look at my kids, they're in my wallet, you know, and I share it with my friends, that's one thing. But if I take a picture of that child and put it on the internet without any restrictions, then that picture goes all over the world and anyone and everyone can use it any way they want to. So am I protecting and honoring my child by broadcasting them to child molesters? If I let that picture of my child appear on a pornographic site, am I honoring my child? If I take and allow the image of my child to be used in a way to create false identities and to even come back at me in some way, if it should happen ever, you know, but let's just say that it was the president's child or any child. All of these circumstances do happen literally on the internet. I know I'm a network engineer. I'm an information system specialist and I'm a certified network engineer. So I know exactly what goes on on the internet. I've been there since used it. I know the internet. That's my ministry. I better know the good side because the bad side is so easy. So in the field of where children are exploited, whether they are kidnapped, whether they are broadcast on the internet or in any way, shape or form somehow manipulated, it's pretty simple to see for me based upon the Bible how my perspective is so challenging to the people because you see they see some video of the child singing oh how great thou art and they say wow what a wonderful thing that is the child is singing how great thou art I wonder how many hours was spent working on that child to sing how great thou art I wonder how much angst was put upon that child in front of a camera in front of a sound system, and then before that, worked on being able to sing that. You see, most people just take for granted, oh, that child has a natural gift. No, they don't. There's a parent somewhere that has made a child to do what they're doing in order for that to be accomplished on the internet. They had to create something in their own image of what they wanted in order for that child to do it. Because you see, a child is a blank slate in many ways. They have an innocency that God said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. They just believe. They just accept. They just receive. And they are just created by your hand into the image you make them. So what image is portrayed when you put them on the internet? Oh, but they're singing Christian songs. And so they go on and on and on. And do they really know what they're singing? Or do they know what they're doing? 
or has somebody manipulated them into doing it? So that's even the point one. How did the initial idea come about? You see, that's what you always have to look at. What's the intent? What is the attitude of the heart behind the scenes of what went on? Because when I was in the Jesus movement, I worked behind the scenes, not in front. I worked at some of the major, quote unquote, big names, like being a security guard in the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Oh, I saw the sets in the early days. I saw, oh, the people in the early days. I know what went on. I helped work construction over at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association. I saw how sometimes people were treated. Oh, does that mean that TBM was evil? No. Does it mean the Full Gospel Businessmen was evil? No. Does it mean people are people? Yes. And how easily things could be manipulated into what we want them to be. The example at Trinity would be with a set that you see isn't anything but a set. Now it's a little different because they have a big natural, big kind of like museum place that they film. And you can go in and you can take tours and you can watch videos and all that kind of stuff. It's a touristy thing. But you see, because I was born in Los Angeles, California, which means Hollywood set, I'm well aware of mentalities, attitudes, and actions to create a idea of something as opposed to the reality of it, and then to inspire that idea to become reality. Like this thing. Grew up there. Used to watch the fireworks every night. <laughs> Spoiled. So, a lot of things that men and women do Christians just kind of go and glaze over and say, but I like what the result is. So the end justifies the means. That child who only wanted to be loved, who only wanted to be accepted, who is willing to do anything for the parent to just be loved. Oh, is willing to become a child preacher. <gasps> Wow, look at them. They know the Bible inside and out. It's a natural God-given ability. Oh, look at that child singer. Oh, wow. They just have the voice of angels. It's a natural God-given ability. Wow. And the intent. Oh, but our little baby, we just want them to grow up. And what is the loss of innocency? The loss of innocency was when Adam and Eve bit the apple and they decided to not obey God. Every man, every woman is given a commandment from God. Train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart. When you train up a child to be a movie star, guess what happens? The parent is kicked off to the side of that And you see that in Child Stars. Child Stars now are coming out with child molestation stories of being abused by their parents in order to be this image of what they wanted them to be. We see Hollywood moms, Hollywood dads, making their children into being rock stars, the next American idol. Oh, did we say American Idol? That's not really an idol just because thousands of people worship it. Not really, anyways. That's not an idol. We don't do that to our worship leaders. We don't make our children into idols. We don't worship those people. We really worship God and how they're singing. But they're so cute. So we pass them around a lot more than we pass around the Word of God. So we pass around this video of them, this picture of them. And it's not exploitation because even though the intent was questionable, now the end result is good, right? We have now this end result. We have this wonderful little kid who runs around preaching. He knows the Word of God. 
You ever seen the little children preachers? You ever get them aside and ask them about Jesus? And ask them about childish things, foolish things, things like playing and having fun. It's funny how most of the child evangelists seem to turn out to be very legalistic, very preaching, but not teaching, very dogmatic, but not so loving, very adamant, but not very forgiving. It's strange how that works. Funny how the loss of innocency causes scarring of the soul. And Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of God. We as adults, don't we know what we want to be? Or do we think that innocency is ignorance? So the children no longer can return to being children anymore. Because why? They grew up to become adults when they were still meant to be children. Oh, but the scripture says a little child shall lead them. Which little child? You should know the answer. Because there's only one child in scripture that leads. So the exploitation of children that I write and post isn't just about what the parents do. No. It's about what you do. Do you look at those pictures and go gaga over them? Or do you look at them and say how sad, how tragic. It's too bad that that child can't be loved as they are, for who they are, where they are. But they had to be made into something else than what they were. Do you pass it around so everyone can get their fingers on it? Like we started at the beginning. Do you participate in the spirit of what's going on behind the scenes of it? You don't think so? Where does that picture wind up if it's posted on the internet? Where does that picture go if you're the one who's the parent and you're responsible for your child and you are accountable to God for your children? What happens to that photo chopped picture if it's pasted and posted somewhere else. What happens to that video when it's used for evil means? But that doesn't happen, does it? Why not do what the scripture says then do what you want to do? Because you see, being a God maker means you take something and you make it into your own image and you control it with your own power and you assert your authority over it as a God. And Jesus said, now you are gods, but you will die like men. Now you are gods? Dare we not look at that scripture and say, what does he mean? How could it be so far from us to be gods? Not us. We might be the next American Idol, but we're not gods. Or are we? Television evangelism has proved we're God makers. Wealthy preachers have proven there are gods of men in our midst. I can't answer for those men who choose to do what they do in setting up what they do and how they serve God. But you know what I can do? I can remember a song a long time ago that I heard for the first time and it broke my heart 
Who will speak up for the children? Helpless and helpless of them. They've got a right to choose life they don't want to lose. I've got to speak up for you. Who will speak up for the little ones? Phil Keggy wrote a song. Randy Stonehill sang it too. And it was written for abortion. And it meant to save the children that were being aborted. But you know, if you aren't willing to take care of your children, and you divorce, and you leave your children behind, and you think that somehow that's okay. If you keep your children and make them into little gods, or paste them all over the internet, and give them egos that are so huge that they can't be brought down, if you decide that it's okay to pretend like you're not exploiting children because you've got some dictionary idea of what exploitation is and you don't think manipulation of a child's innocence is, isn't exploitation if you think that walking away from your responsibility old man of God or man that you are that you spilt your seed into a woman's womb and you've caused creation to happen and that there's a child born of that and that woman has an abortion and you're not responsible for that life you don't think God will require you for your seed your sperm if you think God doesn't see what goes on behind the scenes of all of these things and knows the heart of the matter and the only thing I can say to you is, Lord, teach us to pray. Because except God show you how these children are exploited, you'll always think that Christianity is just another Disneyland ride. And that all you got to do is pay the price and get on the ride. And we're going to get to the end. But if you grieve, if you hurt for the abandonment of children from their fathers and mothers, if you know within your heart how wrong it is for any person to be raised without a father, without a mother, if you know what it's like to see children abused by their parents, creating them into their own image, without using any scriptural means and the parents doing the best that they can but they still wind up being manipulated by the world system to make their children become something they never should have been Lord teach us to pray because except God answer that prayer I don't know what to tell you if you can't see it already you never win. Children have a right to know God. It's not a privilege to go to school in public school. It's not a right to have a public education. It's not a responsibility of government to provide for housing and shelter of a child. As a matter of fact, the responsibility for a child is put on a man and a woman to be fruitful and multiply. It was never meant to be society's burden, but it was meant to be the responsibility of each and every one of us to take up that desire for the children to come unto Jesus, to suffer them to come unto them, to suffer so that they could, in other words, for us who are spiritual, who do know the truth, the facts, to do whatever it takes to bring the children to Jesus. There's a song 
dwarf and a story called the Pied Piper of Hamelin. And he whistled a tune, and the children went off, and they followed him off to a fairy tale land where they ate sugar plum fairies and gingerbread mans. And the parents lost the right to their children because they sold them into slavery. How dare we exploit our children by pasting and posting them on Facebook, much less anywhere else, and not protect them and nourish them and cherish them. When I see a father and a mother, or I see a mother holding a child, I am blessed. When I see a father holding a child, I'm blessed. When I see a family picture, I am moved with tears. When I see a group setting of children together playing and laughing and carrying on, I am amazed. But when I see a picture of one person, one child, being exonerated and exalted and being pasted and posted and pawned over by God who knows what on the internet. Then I don't say to you, do not do it. I don't tell you what to do. I don't tell you how to do it. I don't even tell you what you should do. But I tell you, you in all truth, how dare I not speak up and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? For such is the kingdom of God. And look what they've done to your children. Look what we've done to your son. You died that we would be free from this world and its ways. And look what we've done to the children. And so, who will speak up for the children? Because they have no idea what they are doing. But the parents do, and the people that put them there do. So I say to you, God forgive us God, forgive us. For you gave us the ability to have children for a little while, but to, our responsibility was to lift them up to you so they would know you and find love you and to be aware of you. And now we fail you, God. Help us, God, forgive us, God deliver us from ourselves. Because we may have prepared a whole generation for hell with no possibility of salvation. Dare we fail our children? to not give them Jesus and let Jesus lead us in how we should train up a child in the way they should go so that when they are old they will not depart I say so I do say so and you know what God already said so. So if you have a family, God bless you. If you come from a broken home, like people tell me I did, I'm a bastard by the way, then God bless you. If you come from a child abuse situation, well, God bless you. God can be your father, because he said he'd be a father to the fathers. And I know, he is. If you come from any circumstance where you've been exploited or the world has manipulated you or anything else has caused some great conflict to you. You know what? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. <laughs> Behold, all things become new. <laughs> Even children. All you got to do is be in Christ, to be in Jesus, to be born again.